All right, welcome back everyone. I have a very special guest, a very old friend that has been I'm awesome. Not that old. <laughs> no, she's I'm not saying you're old. We've been know we've known each other for about 18 years. And I've got on the line here Fiona Murden, the author of Defining You: How to Profile Yourself and Unlock Your Full Potential. And if you're interested at all about learning about your personality types or your characteristics, you have basically done a whole novel about that, understanding people's personalities, how it relates to jobs, relationships, and the whole gauntlet of psychology. So welcome to the show. So great to connect. We've been going back and forth like this for months, and uh, I know you've got a lot going on with your book launch, but thanks for taking the time and coming on out here. No, it's fun. Thank you. It's good to connect. Yeah, yeah. Talking about connecting, we just talked uh, before this call about how easy it is for people to connect now. When we met in Australia, we were in Perth, Western Australia, back in like 1999 or 2000, and we did everything by like email and or like <laughs> those old Vodafone like t t t t t t texting, and we were just saying, how did we even keep in touch after all this time? Because with social media, it was before that was even a thing. And I was like, well, when I opened my account, what, one of us must have sent each other an invite when Facebook yeah. gets, goes through your email contacts. Like that's, that's pretty much how it must have uh, went down. But it's, uh, it's cool to reconnect all this time later and see all the amazing things that you're up to. And you too. I mean, you, you're leading an exciting life, going off to Bali, surfing, and I'm not jealous at all. <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess you're just saying how in England where you are, it's kind of rainy there. And I'm like, man, I just got back from a month of surfing and sunshine in Bali. I kind of yeah. feel like I'm still kind of sunburnt. But well, I, had a, I had a Pilates session with a lady yesterday who's Canadian, actually. And she um, she just spent a week in Costa Rica surfing. Oh, wow. And I was like, I just don't want to hear about all this surfing. It makes me really jealous. <laughs> it's, it's funny because that's where we met in Australia. And I was surfing in Perth around Scarborough Beach area there, there, right? And so, yeah, it was Scarborough, yeah. Yeah. It was great. It's a great life, there. lifetime ago. So let's bring everyone up to speed. What's going on in your life with this new book and just this huge new uh, endeavor you've been putting together with all the, uh, the research you've done? Yeah, so um, I mean, I've been profiling senior leaders for, well, I, I can't, <laughs> since, since not long after I met you, I went back to university. I'd done an undergraduate degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. I went back and did a um, postgraduate degree. And in the UK, to become what we call chartered psychologist takes seven years. And I sort of set off on that path. And I already had background in business, so yeah. I stayed in business and ended up working with leaders in business. And a lot of what I do is, or particularly now, is if a CEO or an MD is joining a company, uh, uh, they may get down to their last two, and then they will ask me to come in or, or one of my colleagues and spend four hours profiling that individual. And that means going back through from their childhood and working up to where they are today um, and through that, looking at um, what their strengths are, what, their, what might trip them up, um, what their stress points are, how emotionally resilient they are, how they go about problem solving, um, how they influence other people. And so it really comes down to who's the best person to hire in the right. context of where this organization's at. And, and it's, it's, it's fun, I enjoy it. And then I often end up coaching people afterwards. So. It seemed, but the thing that I've really struggled with over the years is I did psychology to help people. Mm. And I seem to be helping the people who are in very <laughs> top positions. And I think about well, what about everyone else? And so the book, as much as anything, was to try and put learnings from my experience um, into something that anyone can access. So it's, you know, it's why should it just be leaders that get this? I wanted anyone to be able to pick it up and work through their own story and work out where their highs and lows were and where they can shine, where their passions are, um, how to operate at their best, all that sort of stuff. So that was the point behind it. That's so fascinating because I've been really, really blown away by these self-evaluation quizzes like Myers-Briggs and these self-assessment 
personality traits and tests. Like it's yeah. so fascinating how asking these certain questions can literally give you a pinpoint answer on who, who, what this person is, what they're like, their, their, their characteristics. And like, I've done Myers-Briggs a number of times and there's a number of different ones out there. And I'd love to kind of get your feedback on different uh, resources that you've kind of come up with in your research. But one thing that you mentioned that I think is really important that one of my first business mentors said, hire slow, fire fast. So a company takes so much resources to hire and train a new person that it's very important to bring someone like yourself on board to really make sure that they're, they're, they're bringing the right person on. And there's just a huge, huge need to look into someone's psychology to really figure out, will this person be a good fit for this position in this, in this organization? And if not, and especially after a number of weeks, months, or years, hopefully it doesn't get to years, but if you find that that's not the right person, but to let them go immediately because they're going to be costing you more money, keeping yeah. the wrong person on board. So and actually, yeah. And actually from a moral perspective, I think it's not fair on anyone. It's not fair on the pe them themselves because they'll be struggling. Right. Um, it, it's not fair on the people working for them. And, you know, people often struggle with letting people go and we'll give them a bit longer or we'll try and work it out or maybe things will change but I totally totally agree with you you have to get people out quickly when they're not right and as long as it's an adult transparent conversation with that individual it shouldn't be harmful to anyone right. and I know that sounds idealistic but I do think you can do it in a way I know I've seen one guy I coach who's an MD and he's so good at going in when he goes into new organizations and pulling a team around them very quickly of the right people, but mm. without offending or undermining people's self-esteem who he lets go. Mm. So there is a, there's a knack and there's a way of doing it. And it is, it is, you have to be quite skilled, I think, to do that. And I'm not saying I could do that, but uh, yeah, it's definitely the right ethos. Yeah, so for people that are wanting to, is there any kind of hacks around this, like to beat like to say the right thing to get the position that they want? Like what are, what are these, I guess, either CEOs or company owners, what's the main traits that they're really looking for in a new hire, would you say? Well, and I know, really I know it depends on each position, but is there like a general, I guess, cookie cutter, say this in your interview and you'll be good? <laughs> no, not at that level. I had this conversation with someone the other day. Someone in HR was trying to get me to, I'd created a template of what the ideal MD would look like. Mm -hmm. um, and they were trying to get it down even more and sort of being very, very precise and yes, it's and no's. And I said, you just can't do that because at that level you're dealing with such complex scenario in terms of the other people on the team, um, the, you know, what is the company positioning at this time? Where do they want to go in terms of their strategy? There's so many factors that I just think, unfortunately, there isn't a, a quick win. But I think what I do find is the more senior and, uh, and experienced people are very honest in interviews mm. because they know that if it's not right for them, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's important that they get that fit as it is the organization. Well, that's the thing. Like, I think a lot of people forget that the person interviewing is probably just as nervous as the interviewee because they've got just as much, probably even more riding on getting the right person to fill that, that vacancy than the person applying for it. Because even if you look at it, if it's not the CEO, it's the manager, the company owner is going to look at the manager being like, well, why did you hire this person? Why, you know, like there's a lot of pressure in bringing in the right talent. And people think that it's just one way that the pressure is on the person applying for the job. But in reality, it, both people have to make the right decision there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even at junior levels, you should go into interviews with the attitude of, do I want to work for this company? Is this the right company for me? Mm -hmm. um, it's a two-way conversation. Yeah. And I had an interesting conversation just uh, the other day with somebody talking about the whole application process. And my feedback was, well, you should go and apply for jobs that you don't want, especially if you haven't been interviewing for a while, because you want to get that practice and get that, you know, familiarity and comfortable, yeah. uh, 
confidence before you find a job that you really, really want. It's kind of like, you know, training basically to, to have a few, a few uh, interviews under your belt before you go for the one that you really want. Because yeah. going in like, you know, on, on the first, if you haven't been in a job interview for a long time and you just go for your dream job right away without having any other interviews for the last months or years, it, it's, it's not a very, uh, very wise decision. So that's, uh, that's a conversation that just came up the other day. Do you think that there's a lot of overlap between for character types and personalities, studying them and assessing them for jobs as well as relationships? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's relationships are a key element of, I mean, obviously it's different types of relationships, but relationships are a key element of being a good leader. Um, and so this, there is overlap. And I think what's interesting is um, when, you, when I'm working with people and coaching them to become better leaders, it actually is the skills you're learning. And this, I guess, comes back again to me wanting to democratize stuff. Mm -hmm. are the skills that anyone can learn to live a happier, healthier, more fulfilled life because it's about improving. I mean, the one thing is you said, what, what's the one thing I guess with CEOs? It's self-awareness. And I think self-awareness is, oh, it sounds cheesy, but it's a lifelong journey yeah. and you have to keep fine tuning it and checking it depending on the situation you're in. And I think that's something that leaders good leaders tend to have. I mean, if you look at the states, you can compare Obama to Trump and say one has, one hasn't, and then make your own sort of judgment on that. But um, it's, it's that continually wanting to know more about yourself and what that means and, and how that impacts the world around you. And that includes relationships. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it definitely is a skill set to learn. Um, basically learning about yourself is probably the most important skill anyone can learn to be yeah, and, and comfortable one, and confident. One, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, one, that's one of my development points. I talk over people. So apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of, um, the things I do say though, if I'm talking to teenagers is self reflection is very different from self analysis mm. and self analysis can take you down a really negative spiral. Mm. Um, and you start unpicking yourself in an, un an unconstructive way, it can be quite harmful. Whereas self-reflection um, and curiosity about who you are and what that means in the context of the world, there's a slight difference, but the, the impact is massive. Right. One has a really positive outcome, one can have an incredibly detrimental outcome. And it's sort of realizing that difference is quite important. Right. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And so what does your daily routine look like? Like, are you constantly working with new clients? Are you doing a lot of research still? Is this, is this your business that you're running? Or are you working with a, uh, an organization? Like, I'm just kind of curious of, of how you have structured all of this expertise and how you're, you kind of built it. So I worked um, for a company who worked with Fortune 500, FTSE 100 sort of companies for a number of years. And then when I had my daughter 12 years ago, there's a company which is called ICI, um, which is a big paints and chemicals company in the UK. And it's sold to another company called Axe and Abel. And the CEO and the CFO moved to become CEO and chairman of another company. And I was on maternity leave and they said, Fiona, you couldn't just come in because they'd heard I was getting a bit bored you couldn't just come in and see some CFOs for us. And then it was HR directors. And then they would said, could you tender for the work? And this was a global company. And I thought, oh, this is silly because I'm not going to get it. But I did it and I won it. And um, I also, at the same time, another company called Lloyd's of London, which is an insurance broker, one of the HR directors from that other company had gone there. And she said, oh, you couldn't just come in and meet our CEO, could you? And so that's how I ended up. I set up my own company. And now I work with uh, companies like Selfridges, which is a department store in the UK, who they own help Renfrew in Canada, which you may have heard of. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I work with companies like Burberry. Um, so I'm work I've been working with the board at Burberry and um, 
we're, we're running a program that runs down throughout the organization and that's working with colleagues who do a similar thing um, and I'm trying to think of international names so in the past I've worked with companies like BP and Cadbury um, oh. and so it's I'm always doing stuff and I'm always working with colleagues who do similar things because it's quite niche so we sort of rely on each other's expertise and we collaborate and do stuff together um, and so I'm doing that on the one hand and then on the other hand I'm doing um, a lot of talks mm. so um, uh, places like London School of Economics. I'm going in in a couple of weeks to do a talk to students um, and then in companies as well. So insurance firm, AXA, um, Selfridges, again, um, the Royal College of Surgeons. And I've written a couple of medical papers. So, um, so to summarize, you're kind of a big deal. <laughs> no, no, I'm busy. You're kind of a big it. deal. You've grown into this great, you know, authority finger in this area, which is amazing. And congratulations for that. Like that's, that's oh, like, those, those I mean, as I say, I feel like it's just, it's what I do, but it's, I want, my real passion is trying to give more people the tools around psychology. Hmm. So it's not just the leaders. Um, right. It's, it's the population more generally. And how I'm going about that is a new journey. So I'm, I'm finding that, public facing bit is strange so talking to yesterday i spoke to two journalists of different newspapers in the uk and then i think you see how you're quoted and you think no i didn't mean that i didn't say that and so that's a whole new learning for me that piece wow well that's part of the evolution process i guess of just continually leveling up and charting new paths and territories and that's exciting and with your book so how did this book come about um so i wrote a different book uh, first. So first of all, I wrote, I wrote, I've written chapters for more academic books and then I thought, hey, I could write a book. So I wrote a book and then I naively thought if you wrote a book, then you just present it to a publisher and they go, oh, great, we'll publish that. And it didn't work like that. Um, so I ended up <laughs> instead writing this book, which is what the publishers wanted. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been published internationally. And actually it won an award last week I think in the States wow. um, a business book award which was very odd because I didn't even know my publishers had entered it into this thing and then they sent me an email said congratulations you've won silver in the set and I was like what hello um, wow. and I'm finalist for an award in the UK as well which is I mean other books that I'm up against are just ridiculously good so I don't expect to <laughs> get anywhere with it but well, that's, that, that's a huge topic these days, you know, like personal development, uh, the whole positive psychology, self-help niche is massive, you know, and to, to be able to make a name for yourself in that is a huge feat. And to be let alone, uh, let alone nominated for an award, but you won this, the, won it like the second, second place. That's, that's amazing. Like, congratulations on that. That's, that's a huge. It's, it still hasn't, I still can't get my head around it really. I'm like, right? what? Especially as I didn't know they'd entered me, so it was all a bit. I was, yeah, well, that might be the that might be the best way to do it because if you if it doesn't really turn out very well, you never knew that it didn't. But exactly. if you did, it's like a bonus. It's very true. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. And um, and so I've got two more books um that I'm working on at the moment as well. Wow, what are they about? Uh, one is for teenagers on a similar topic, but trying to bring. Um, some of the tools and tips to teenagers just because I really worry about the teenage population currently and the suicide rates and yeah. um, I'm not suggesting it will solve that but hopefully it'll just provide another tool and then the other one's for adults and it's around different mechanisms of learning um, it, it is actually more interesting than that but it sounds very boring but <laughs> my uh, publishers have told me I'm not to say anything yet about it and so um, that, that, that's the other one. Okay. One, one resource that might be interesting if you're talking about learning. Are you familiar with Jim Quick? No. You should check him out. He's got like the, uh, he's got a huge, huge platform. Um, he's got like one of the top rated podcasts in the world. So his whole thing is quick. His whole brand is called quick brain, how to learn anything fast and remember like how to speed read, but how to like quadruple your, your processing and, and, um, 
and memory and, and learning like a really, really sharp guy. Like he's, uh, yeah, he, he might be a good, good resource or someone for me to potentially interview for your, uh, for your book. He's, uh, well, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, I'll look him up. Yeah. Yeah. Jim quick. Um, well that's awesome. So talking about the, uh, the whole teenage niche, man, I can't even fathom what it must be like being a teenager in this social media cell phone addicted world. Like it's, it's, I just talked to, uh, I had a, an episode in, in, uh, I was going to say Byron Bay in, uh, <laughs> in, in Bali, uh, with a guy, he, uh, he does depression, um, counseling and oh, yeah. yeah, we were talking about just how crazy these kids get over, not having their phone like you just see these videos online of kids freaking out if they get their phone taken away from them we haven't really seen the long-term residual mm -hmm. effects from this yet either like this is very new uh new uncharted territories really so what's your take on where we are and where it's going um i find it quite scary i think it is altering the there isn't a huge amount of research on the impacts on the brain but it is um, definitely altering the way our brain is operating or their brain. So um, if you think about uh, Daniel Kahneman who uh, wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, so we've got the two, in a very basic form, we've got the two parts of our brain. The, the slower part is the more evolved part that, that's decision-making and meaning and connection. And the fast part is the emotion and the survival piece. But what we're doing is we're tapping into those kids' survival the whole time. And so they're in fight and flight mode the whole time. And they're wow. stressed. And they're not also not developing that connection with the more evolved part of the brain, which helps to manage emotions. Um, and usually during teenage years, right up into what's called emerging adulthood, those connections are developing and they're, we're, we're almost... Um, suffocating their ability to do that um, which is it's scary yeah yeah no no kidding it's uh, I, I'm glad that I grew up in the day and age when I had to tell my friend I'm like all right let's meet here tomorrow at yes. six o'clock I'm gonna ride my bike here we'll be Absolutely. here tomorrow at yeah. six. and then you had yeah, to I mean, you, you had to yeah. be you had to go because there's no way to just like you know bail on that no, absolutely. I, yeah, and no, I think that myself. I think, you know, I got, I went everywhere on my bike and it was making that arrangement with your friend the day before <laughs> and then you couldn't contact them otherwise. Or you maybe, you know, you could use the phone in the house, but yeah. your parents want, didn't want you to use that. And yeah. So it was the, the dial up. Ding, 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 ding. Exactly. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Um, did you ever see that video that's out right now with those kids that have a dial up rotary phone and they can't figure out how to use it and they like <laughs> no. it, it no. went viral on Facebook there's like these three kids their parents say here try and make a phone call with this and they just couldn't do it it was like it was it was hilarious but also kind of disturbing um, <laughs> how, how just out of, out of touch they are but um, cool well let's uh, let's kind of look at where uh where do you think the uh what are some kind of psychology hacks is there any kind of hacks that you uh teach or have researched to kind of reprogram the brain or the mind to kind of look at things in a more positive way like to like you mentioned in your book to to reach your full potential is there gratitude list meditation yeah. things like that all those things and i think that the, there's something that i really like that has been there's the National Health Service in in the UK I think is kind of known everywhere and it's in crisis and <laughs> one thing they came up with which I find frustrating that they're not advertising is something called the mental health five a day and so um, I don't know if you have this or if it's more global but in the UK we have five a day being you have to have five fruit and veg a day and so they've tried to create that mm. analogous sort of connection and it's really helpful because it's saying, uh, and I won't be able to remember them all now, but there's um, mindfulness, so meditation. Um, there's physical activity, mm -hmm. learning, connection with other people, and then there's helping other people. 
And those are all things that fuel our brain positively. And that doesn't mean the helping other people thing, you know, it's, it doesn't mean you have to suddenly sign up to a charity and run a 10K or something like that. It's literally little things like um, you see someone in the supermarket who's struggling with something and you just, you get the tin down off the shelf for them. Or right. Those things are actually really great for our brain and they make us feel much happier. Um, and it sounds obvious as well, but connecting with people like, like we are rather than doing it on yeah. um, messenger and stuff, it right. releases higher levels of oxytocin, which are good for the brain. Mm. And so being outside, being in, and the thing that I think is the easiest way to think of it is imagine where our brain would be in its most natural state and take it to that. Mm. And actually that would be being outside, sitting around a fire, talking to people. Right. Well, that's, that's one thing I've really been kind of big on lately is like this kind of, I guess, life hacking slash biohacking to try and get in as close to nature as possible. Like, for example, like I wear these glasses to block the blue light coming from screen or, or yeah, like it's, if you look at the, the, the real health, um, disaster, a lot of it comes from artificial light. Like it's, it, it triggers, it does it doesn't, it doesn't release melatonin from your brain. So like if you're looking at screens at night, you're not getting the melatonin natural release from your brain because back when the caveman era is at night, there was no artificial no light. light. Yeah. Absolutely. So even Absolutely. I actually, I wrote that in my first book, oh, okay. um, one that's not published, <laughs> but that was, and I actually used a caveman in it and I, I brought a caveman um, called Oxy the Iceman to life and I talked and publishers weren't quite sure about that, <laughs> but it was, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it, you know, the light is one massive thing. Yeah. And with my kids, um, they have screen down time. So uh, my youngest puts screens down, all screens at six o'clock. And my eldest is seven o'clock. And, you know, friends come around and they're like, whoa. And I'm, I'm sorry, but that's what we do in this house. We put the screens down. That's so the important. Girl, that's so yes. good. Yeah, um, that's so good. One other, one other thing you might look at is on their screens, you could actually put it on to the uh, filtering out the blue light, even without glasses, just on the, the tablet. You can put it on night mode, which makes it oh, more, really? more, yeah, it makes it more orange. So it takes off the, the brightness. It makes it very dim. So you might look at putting that in just in your settings. Just go to display and put it oh, on to night mode. And it, I have mine on night mode all day. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that now. <laughs> I like that. Because yeah. it is something I'm really conscious of. I think it's, um, you know, we're, we're battering our brain with artificial noise and light the whole time. And our brain is sort of overloaded. Yeah. I wanted to, talking about noise, have you heard of binaural beats? No. Okay. Um, so binaural beats is, is basically like, uh, if you just go on YouTube and just put in binaural beats, but there's these apps and I have, I did a, an interview. I've, I've been familiar with it for quite a while, but I had this kind of neurosurgeon, like NLP genius on the, my podcast a while back. And I said, what's the number one Thing you do to kind of hack your happiness and your uh, psychology and, and brain health and he said binaural beats are constantly playing in his ear so he's got these earbuds and even if he's listening to music or a podcast it's in the background and he sleeps with oh, them wow. in yeah the, the the app that i have it's, it's just called brainwave so on apple it's just called brainwave um and it, i've been using it and that thing is the real deal it sounds kind of weird just like this ambient but I've read a lot of research and studies about it. And yeah, binaural, binaural beats is a, a good way. And then there's ones for like depression, for anger, for stress relief, like all these different frequencies, basically. Oh, wow. That's yeah. fantastic. That, can be, really, that can be in your next book. You can give me credit yeah. in your next book for that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Quentin said. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really interesting. It's really right. good to hear, actually. Because I have noise cancelling headphones. Know, right, yeah. And um. And they don't completely cancel the noise, but um, I wear those on the train and into London because mm. I just find I'm less stressed if I've yeah. got. Yeah, well, have, have, those, have those beats playing while you're canceling the noise. It, it'll just put you in a zone, like dial, mm. dial it in. It's really good. Excellent. I'm learning lots. I'm learning lots. I like there, it. Yeah, there you go. 
Um, but no, I, I learned a lot from you as well. So thanks for sharing those, those five, uh, five kind of, uh, tips as well. Those are, those are key. And I try and do a lot of those as well. Um, I kind of want to be mindful of your time. You've been going for about 30 minutes. Is there anything you want to kind of touch on? And we have your book that people should go and pick up and definitely leave you a review. I know that oh, reviews are, we're, talk, we're talking before the episode to, to go ahead and, uh, and pick that up and make sure you leave a review because the algorithm and Amazon loves that feedback. So maybe if you want to do a little promo about all the good things people will learn in your book, I've got it on Kindle here as well. So I, I gave I you. you. Well, yeah. I mean, the one, the one thing that is a selling point, which means I don't have to sell myself <laughs> is there's a, there's access to a psychometric on it. Um, and that usually costs um, in UK pounds, a hundred pounds. Right. And it, you get it free with the book. And it produces a six-page report. So a bit like you were talking about Myers-Briggs. This yeah. one's based on five-factor theory of personality. And it's been developed by psychologists. Um, and it's got some quite uh, complex algorithms in it. And wow. so it does some nice, it has some nice subtleties in the way it presents the information back to you. So that in itself, I think is worth it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then I've, I've got lots of stuff from other psychologists um, that I've asked permission to put things in there. So there's, there's, a, um, there's one on curiosity, there's emotional wisdom, um, there's one on circadian rhythms. Uh, mm. So whether you're more of a morning person or a nighttime person when you're at your peak. Um, so lots of different tools in there, which I've, I've drawn from a lot of different uh, experts around the world. Right. So that's what I would say is more of a selling point than anything. Um, well, and the fact that you've been researching this and putting a ton of work into it, and then it won awards, and it's it's doing very well. So it's it's uh, it's not just some downloadable ebook; like it's substantial, and there's a lot of great content in there. And those are great bonuses to offer as well. Like, uh, out of curiosity, what would you guess would be my personality type? Oh, that's harsh to do that on live. Um, <laughs> uh, so I would say the thing is, as we get older, if you're talking about Myers-Briggs, we become more introverted. So I think you come across as an extrovert, but you probably are moving more along the line towards introversion as you get older. Mm. Um, then the next one is intuition or sensing. I would guess you'd be intuition, which is sort of more big picture thinking. Um, thinking or feeling, not, not a hundred percent sure on that one. I think you'd probably be, be towards the thinking, but I could be wrong on that. And then the last one, which is P or J, I would say, uh, judging or perceiving, I'd say you're a P. Wow. You have, uh, done very well. So, um, I've done it a number of times and it's always very, very accurate. It comes back basically the same each time. Um, however, I am on the fence between E and I, uh, my, my, my results come back E, so I'm E N F P. So E N F P is my, yeah. so, so if you do the credo, which is the one in, in the book, um, there's an extroversion introversion piece in that, but what you find is it actually breaks it down further. So you'll see your scale on different elements of extroversion and introversion, which is quite oh, wow. nice because, you know, sometimes, so for example, I'm an introvert, but no one ever believes me. I was going to um, ask you what yours is. Yeah, so, so let's yeah, I mean, see. Psychologists, fellow psychologists will say to me, no, you're not an introvert. I'm like, yes, I am. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but it's interesting to see how that breaks down and, and um, where the, you know, which bits, we get more energy from and which we don't. Yeah. That's basically what it comes down so, to. so what's your whole score type? It's on Myers-Briggs. I'm an E or an INFP. INFP. So very, yeah, very so very similar to you. Yeah. Very similar. Okay, interesting. Cool, cool. Okay, great. Um, and what is your, where can people kind of reach out and connect with you? I'll have your links below, but if, if there's anything that you want to kind of share or uh, direct people. Okay, so, so I'm on um, uh, on Facebook, but um, I'm probably most, well, my blog, sorry, <laughs> faltering here. My blog is just my name, which is Fiona Murden, M-U-R-D-E-N.com. 
Okay. And, you know, I've got email address on there and you can comment on blogs and what have you. But then I'm also, I've got a, an author Facebook page, which I'm not very active on, but I would be more active if people sort of came and, you know, saw it. It's just, it's, I feel a bit like, hey, look at me with things like this. Right. And then I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and right. I'm, but I'm not a big fan of social media. Right. What do you so I like is that is that uh, from your research that you see the kind of negative downfalls of it, or just your personality of being an introvert, not really wanting to be out there as that much? It, it's yeah, it's a bit of both. Um, yeah. I I find that I feel like I'm experimenting with Instagram mm. um, because I like pictures. I love posting pictures. Very visual. But find, yeah, but I find it quite invasive as well. So. Mm. Um, but I want to understand it because I want to understand how teenagers are interpreting that world. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it's a whole nother world. I never even got into Snapchat and I'm too old. Oh for no, that. I never got onto Snapchat. <laughs> That's one that guy just passed me by. Yeah. I think we're too old for that one. I don't, yeah. I don't need it. I don't need any like dog ears or like, you know, tongues coming out of my, uh, Although having said that I had a friend and this is where social media is amazing. I had this best friend when I was, um, little so from when I was tiny until when I was eight mm -hmm. we moved and as you say we didn't have social media then so we wrote each other letters oh and yeah we, we wrote each other letters for years and we used to see each other in the holidays and my mum was downsizing last year and she bought or the year before she bought loads of boxes with letters in and I was like oh geez thanks mum and, but I started going through them and I found this friend in our letters. I thought we were really close mm. and we lost contact when we were about 16 and I had tried to find her before. And I thought, right, I am finding this girl now. I'm finding her. <laughs> and I found her sister eventually. And then I tracked her down and I was like, I'm sorry if you think I'm a weirdo. I don't know if you remember me. And she was like, oh yeah. She said, I've told my daughter all about you and I and our friendship. Wow. And I wanted to find you. And actually, we're just really close friends again now. But that's where social media is lovely. Because in For that sure. sense, it's, you know, I, I'm really great mates with this. And it's really odd because even though we've been apart for so many years, we've just fallen straight back into a friendship. That's awesome. That's I can't awesome. remember the point of that story, but... <laughs> I think just with your relationship with social media, it was where that started and uh, where that went. No, that's, that's a really cool story. Yeah, it's, it's good for definitely keeping in touch and reconnecting with people, for sure. It's, it's interesting. Um, actually, I was, I was trying to talk about social media and like reconnecting with friends. I was back in Canada this past summer and I was trying to put together like... It, it was my 20-year high school reunion, if you could believe that, 20 <laughs> years crazy um and just just connecting with all these old people that i haven't seen or like connected with since like high school that was really cool because you get to see what they look like and where they are what they're doing and all that so yeah social media definitely has it's it's uh it's good and bad points i'd say yeah definitely yeah. cool well it's been great this has been uh a conversation brought to you by social media because we stayed connected through our travels in Australia, through email and then reconnecting through, through Facebook. So there's a testament right there of how, uh, how these, you know, long-term connections of can continue. So really cool to kind of reconnect and spend the time uh, seeing you here again. And thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And all the best with all your other new books launching. I'm sure they'll be, be awesome as well. And we'll have your links here below. If people want to get to know uh, Fiona a little more, check out some of her work, get her book, leave a review. You know what to do. And we'll see you all in the next episode. And if someone is interested in, in all this, go ahead, share this episode with them as well. And I appreciate you all tuning in and see you on the next one. Peace.